you throw a chemical fertilizer on a plant, you see an immediate response. It's that yield response you can get with those chemicals. And it's, what do you need to do? Buy this, put it on. With, if you're managing a soil in, in an organic way, you've got to build that soil back up. It's harder. It's, that takes a little bit more patience. Maybe it's just the patience. But certainly you can get reason, you can get yields just as good. And I know guys who are growing uh, row crops who get yields that are better organically. Yeah. It's the trick is they get those that soil really balanced and really tuned in. So it's more information driven. It's yeah, it's more information driven. I think we management we've, driven. I, I would say we've lost fifty years of of learning. The the chemicals have been a, a, a taken us down a path that. We've learned how to use these chemicals and we've learned a lot of stuff about chemicals, but we haven't learned a lot of stuff about biological systems. We haven't learned how do the soils work? What's the biology in the soil that makes it work? How does biocontrol and insects, all this stuff with entomology, that's all new science. Uh, so we've lost time by the introduction of these chemicals. And, and now there's the pressure of, there's a whole industry built up around these chemicals. And, in an uh, in industry to produce them and sell them, and an in industry within the university systems that teaches young people how to use them. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer led movement with an add on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well managed pasture. You just heard from Larry Jacobs, a pioneering organic farmer in California who also partners with farmers in Mexico to grow and distribute cherry tomatoes under the brand Jacobs del Cabo. This partnership then provides markets for hundreds of small growers, primarily in Baja and a few communities in Western Mexico. Larry's work to promote organic farming in Mexico was going on while local governments were funding the introduction of chemical practices and aerial spraying. Before we get back to the interview, if you're enjoying this podcast, please consider becoming a recurring donor at realorganicproject.org so we can continue these important conversations. All recurring donors get access to special content, including our monthly virtual book club, where you can ask our favorite authors your questions. Now back to the interview with Larry. I'm talking to Larry Jacobs today. And Larry, thank you. This is uh, actually a real privilege. It's really I'm looking forward to the conversation. And I'd like to step back from, I'd, I'd like to come back to those issues, but I wanna talk a little bit about your rather um, amazing career because you have taken a very unusual path in your life. Uh, I won't go back to your childhood, but let's start with Elliot Coleman when you apprenticed there. Was that the beginning of your agricultural career? No, no, I was farming, I had a tree nursery in the 1970s, Where was a wholesale that? tree nursery in the San Fernando Valley. All right. And it was just uh, a lot of work. And they, um, uh, part of having a nursery, you were inspected once a year by the county. And the county gave you a nursery license to be able to sell nursery stock. Basically, they were checking to make sure that the stock was clean from insects and diseases so you could sell it. This was a wholesale nursery. They were vigilant about checking the nurseries. and. One year, the county agent came by and he found aphids in these, uh, they were in Monterey pine trees. And he said, well, you, you gotta stop selling this. And, um, and I, I was like 17 or 18, I was a kid. I thought, well, what do I do? And he said, well, you, can, you, can, you need something to spray on it. Well, what do I need to spray on it? He said, well, come over to my house. And I followed him over to his house. He opened up his garage door and out come this knock you down sort of aroma of uh, pesticides as he stored in his garage. And he was selling pesticides, a little side job. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't, I didn't see it as a conflict of interest. He was helping me out. So he pulled down this jug, brown glass, one gallon jug with a cross and skull bowl on it and said, here, just spray this, I'd kill all the aphids. It was uh, the material, I, I still remember what it was. It was Metacystox X. It's just horribly, um, toxic material. He didn't give me any instructions. He just handed me the jug. San Fernando Valley in the summertime is hot. You know, it gets 100 degrees. So I had cutoffs and no shirt and barefoot. And 
I picked up a backpack sprayer from the hardware store and put some of the stuff in the back of the backpack sprayer and started spraying it. And I got really sick. I mean, I, I passed out. And I just couldn't even open the bottle. It just made me nauseous. And I, But he told me you couldn't sell anything until I got rid of all these aphids. So I started looking around for a solution. I don't remember how I came across a guy by the name of Everett Dietrich. You know who Everett Dietrich is? Everett Dietrich was a uh, uh, dropped out of a PhD, group, PhD program at, at uh, UC Riverside in entomology and took a job running their biocontrol lab. It was one of the first biocontrol labs under the UC system. I believe it was in UC Riverside. His daughter's alive. She, could, she can correct the story. But he, and he graduated from that at some point, started a, um, uh, began working with the citrus growers in Ventura County and got them together to start an insectary in Ventura County for citrus. And he was raising insects. But his career was in biocontrol. Him and there was five or six other, in my mind, famous entomologists who wrote the, the textbooks that we use today on, on biological control. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to meet this guy. And he uh, said, um, well, I'll send you some, some lace wings and get a little bit of uh, dish soap and get a hose and mix the dish soap up in, in a little mixer on a, on a hose and then spray, wash those aphids off with, off the plants and then put some of the lace wings around the, on the, in the containers that had the aphids. This was like two acres of trees, the container stock. So it wasn't like the backyard, yeah. but a little bit bigger than the backyard. So that's what I did. I washed off the aphids with a hose, and then he, he sent these lace wings and put the lace wings out in the containers. And a few weeks later, the you know a month later, the inspector came back, and he said, "You didn't buy any more my Meta Six stocks." I said, "Well, take a look at the trees," and there were no more aphids. Yeah, we could find one or two, but there it was really hard to find them. And just just show you that this was a pretty good guy. He then said, you know, you should go back to college. You should go to school. So he really encouraged me. And, he's, and, and I'm teaching a class at junior college on entomology and plant diseases and, and all these different things. And you can, you're welcome to, I'll get you in and you can come in and start my, take my class, even though the, the semester had already started. So he got me to go back to school. And I thought that he had a pretty nice job because he didn't have to, he got paid better than I, he was making more money than I was. And I thought, well, I'll go back to school and I'll, go get a job with the government, you know, something like he was doing. But at some point I uh, felt like, you know, doing that kind of stuff, you really needed to do the farming to be able to go out and do what he was doing. And I was, ag was in attracted to continue doing something in ag. And I ended up at um, Scott Nearing's, Helen Scott Nearing's farm. And they had given Elliot a piece of ground. They sold him a piece of ground for a couple bucks an acre. Yeah. And they shared a piece of an area that Elliot set up as a campsite. So I was staying on the campsite that Elliot set up for his apprentices. Yeah. And that's how I knew Elliot. Yeah, yeah. Were you working with Scott and Helen? I was working with Scott and Helen. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So. I never met Scott. I met Helen. She came by once. She on was her way after Scott had died on her way camping in an organic citrus grove in Florida. Yeah. I, I was pretty impressed. She was outrageous. Yeah. She was quite the woman. Yeah. And Scott was an amazing, yeah, Scott was an inspiring guy. Yeah. He was making a lot of compost. That's what he wanted. She wanted, they wanted me to help him make compost. That's what I did all day. You were shoving Scott compost? Making compost. Yeah. And he had, but his compost, he had a notebook for every compost pile. He had, you know, 30 piles going and he had notes on every single pile. And he had been doing that for 50 years. What went in it, how they came out, you know, how he mixed them. Yeah. Was that anyway. was that a a transformational experience to go? I mean, that that's a different world from yeah, that was. The university you know, system. they they were. Yeah, you know, I was a kid in the back of the class, and it, I did go back to university. And I studied yeah. soils. That was when I graduated. When I went to Scott and Helen's yeah. and met and met Elliot. And it was Elliot. Elliot was it was a good mix because Elliot was really deep into all the old research. And he had this amazing library, which he generously would lend to anybody who was there and yeah. all the old papers. Yeah. And so you know, it was an opportunity to read farmers of, you know, 40 centuries and all of Sir Albert Howard stuff. And so there was a, 
you know, coming, coming out of a soil science program at, in, in a university in California, where I was a kid in the back asking, you know, why is the forest green? Nobody fertilized it and nobody weeded it. This thing seemed to be growing pretty well and never could get a good answer for it. So the, there was just never any really good understanding of the bio, soil biology at that time. So it was 1970s. And here there were people talking about making compost and soil health and you know, recycling uh, night, uh, human waste. And, and, and that's, that made sense to me. Yeah. And uh, that, but what happened at Hel Helen and Scott's and Elliot's place was it turned to winter. And I was from California and we were staying in, uh, Elliot had a little A-frame that my girlfriend and I were staying in. And it was, it was a, the winter of 76, it was, or maybe it was 77, but it was really cold. And I just remember um, going outside to pee in a bucket and the pee froze. And I said to my <laughs> girlfriend, it's time to leave. <laughs> and I had a job offer in Costa Rica with uh, setting up an apple orchard. So we had bicycles and we bought an old beat up rusty old car from the chauffeur of one of the Rockefellers and drove it down to Texas, sold the car, made a couple hundred bucks on it. And we had the bicycles on the back and then headed on our bicycles down to Costa Rica. We never got to Costa Rica. We ended up in Guatemala and where uh, I helped a Canadian guy set up a soil testing lab where we were doing soil testing for small farmers in the Western Highlands. And I remember my uh, soil, the recommendations I made for all the soil tests with the, all the organic matter, any place they had problems, the organic matter was low. And I would say, I, I would do all the tests. We had did nitrogen and N, P and K and some of the micronutrients. And I'd write up, type up a recommendation, and the recommendation always was add a lot of organic matter, <laughs> and because that was what they were they were they were burning off. And the guys that were really successful were bringing in forest litter. You could see it in their soil test. But at that point, I also felt like if I'm going to be making recommendations to farmers, I should be farming. And, and when we came back to the states, we set up a farm here in California, and that became Jacob's Farm, which later. Five years later, we went down to Mexico and started the Del Cabo thing. So tell me about Del Cabo. I mean, that's kind well, of it, an amazing I, story. Yeah, it is. Well, it started with Helen Nearing. All right. Helen showed up when uh, was in the fall at the farm in Pescadero up the coast here and stayed with us for a couple of weeks. And she was going to do a uh, sort of a, a self-realization workshop with a woman by the name of Charlotte. I can't remember her last name, but it was a woman her age who did body work and, and help people just get in touch with their, their, their physical presence. And Helen, Helen had that part of who she was. And so Sandra and I said, well, Helen, how are you getting down there? How about if we drive you down? So she stuck around, we had a bunch of garlic to clean. We finished cleaning the garlic. We put the, the farm to sleep and we all hopped in a little red Honda Civic and drove down to, uh, Barra de Navidad, which was pretty far, wasn't near the border. It was several days south. And after a week of that, we left Helen there at the workshop. And we, just, I I'd always wanted to drive up the Baja Peninsula. And we came over on the ferry and stopped, um, uh, got off in, I can't remember if the ferry went to San Jose El Cabo. I think it went to San Lucas. But from there, we drove over to San Jose, which was the county seat. And we began looking at the farms in the area. And we met the farmers. And they all had the same story. We, have, we can grow all these different crops. But every, everyone, my cousin, is growing the same crops. And when, in the town only has 10,000 people. And they're just, we can't, there's no place to go with it. And we looked at how they were farming. It was similar to what we saw in Guatemala. There were small farms, like an acre, maybe two acres would be a really big farm. Half acre was pretty typical. And they were not using a lot of chemicals, but the US, the uh, Mexican government was begin, just beginning to make these recommendations about pesticides and herbicides. So we were there just the right time before it had really they had really taken hold. Before the government started really promoting it. They were just beginning to promote it. And these yeah. guys hadn't begun using any of this stuff yet. What, oh, what year are we uh, talking? This one we're talking 1985. Okay. 1985. And 
and as we drove, we had that experience meeting these guys and we were impressed with the farming they, they were doing. And as we drove back up the peninsula, there was a little sign on the on highway one coming back that said Pescadero and the farm where we were farming here in California was in Pescadero. And Sandra said, maybe we should do Pescadero South. And so we went back and talked to these guys about they'd be interested in learning how to farm organically if we helped connect them with some markets in the wintertime, but they'd have to learn how to farm organically. And, and when they asked what that meant, they said it means no, using no synthetic chemicals and no synthetic fertilizers. It means building your soil and, and building up biocontrol systems on your farms. And I don't know if, you know if they truly understood what that meant, but they understood what it meant, no synthetic materials. And they thought, wow, that's going to be really hard to do here in the tropics. But we have a lot of insects here, but we'll try it because we got nothing to lose. We're not doing very well with what we're doing. So the president of the AHILA, which was a land management system in those days, hand selected 10 families who he felt had a lot of um, integrity and would follow instructions. And we began farming with these 10 families. And we would be on each farm every day from growing the transplants to or seeding direct, and dealing with the weeds and all the way through the harvest. And, and we uh, ultimately sent all that stuff to the States in the wintertime as a winter supply of organic crops. And that's how it started. Now, was there a market at that point in like 85, 86 yeah. for organic in California? Yes, there was. All right. So that before we committed to doing this with them, we went and met with um, Boo Nigram and Jane, Mary Jane, who started a company called Veritable Vegetable, which is one of the oldest organic distributors in, in the country, I would guess. Yeah. And we also, later the following year, we met with a guy who was on doing the same thing on the East Coast, Joe, I can't remember his last name now. Oh, uh, you might know. I him. do know. Uh, worked, for, yeah. Anyway, we asked Mary Jane and Boo, and there was a this, there was a Santa Cruz trucking was in Santa Cruz doing a similar thing. We met with both of them and said, if somebody had a winter supply of organically grown crops, what would you want? So they gave us a list of what would you want and how much, I mean, how many boxes. And I still have the notebooks of those notes or those conversations with them. And that was our, the farm plan that we took back with these 10 guys. And were, those, were you also Joseph Dunsmore? Were you also? Joseph Dunsmore, that's yeah. right. That's yeah, I sold to him. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, he was the very first one who was distributing organic that I knew of. So were you also shipping some of it east? The second year of either, either in 87 or 88, uh, we began, we called Joseph Dunsmore. Yeah. And at one point, Joseph Dunsmore and Boo and Mary Jane and the guys from San Cruz Trucking and there was a few other people, we invited them all down to see it. So all these guys made, came down to the tip of the Baja and uh, the farmers did this big buffet lunch. They cooked and prepared all the food from, from the farms. And they toured the, at that time, there was probably 30 or 50 farms that they toured and they met all the farmers and, and ate the food that the farmers were growing and everybody went home. But it was a great, the, the farmers were like, and you guys do what? And how many people are eating organic food? And they had all kinds of questions. And they were, they were now into it yeah. and they were, they were getting good results. Uh, they, were, they were seeing it was working. They were seeing that it was working, yeah. Yeah, so they saw we can grow this way, it works. Yeah, I mean, we, I was doing composting classes and we were teaching these guys how to do compost and we were working with the county to give us ways to make more compost. And, uh, and I said, well, you guys, you're gonna continue doing this? You have to make compost, that's the rule. Yeah. So I was making up these rules. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, but it worked. Yeah. And then we did you know, compost tea and the, there's somebody was seeing some plants being a little pale and the plants would turn green. And um, we had some problems with, uh, the, the biggest problems were insects that were introduced that, that had come from far away. Yeah. And those we needed help with. And Everett Dietrich was still alive and he came down and helped with a lot of those things. And we ended up in bringing in some parasitoids that didn't exist. Uh, figuring out what we had and 
what parasitoids would work on it and where they were and what part of the world they came from. And we would work with the Mexican government, the US government to do quarantines on them and bring in a parasitoid that would control these new things that were yeah. causing a problem. So Larry, I'm, I'm curious, I really am. It, 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 there must have been an indigenous agriculture that was not chemical down there. Yeah, they the were traditional ag. The, the traditional ag. That's we stepped in while that was still happening. It was still there. It was still there. But it, but it the was government. The government. It was in danger. Yeah, the government. There were two things that were endangering it. One was the government's push to insist that people used um, uh, these chemical materials, and they had began these phytosanitary uh, systems where they weren't going to. They were starting to inspect things that were coming in, and if they found a pest in the field, they were requiring people to spray it. This was hap this happened the year or the year the second year I was there, and the growers came up to me and said, "Hey, the government's telling us we have to spray this material. What do we do?" I said, "Who, who from the government?" They said, "Took me over to the guy's office. There was a the, the Ministry of Agriculture had an office and a, a small group of agronomists that, that worked for them who were going out in these fields and, and checking the fields. And if they found something they thought was a pest, they were telling them you have to spray this material." So I went and talked to them and said, look, if you make these guys spray these materials, this whole program that we started is going away. It's going to end. I'll tell you what, why don't I teach your agronomist how to do biological control? So I started doing on weekends, on Saturday afternoons, I would do classes with the, with the agronomist for the Mexican government in, in, in this county. And they then began going out to the fields and doing the recommendations that I was had been doing. And so that allowed us to scale this thing because now I had the all I had five more agronomists that were paid for by the by the county, by the Mexican government, to support biological control programs in the area. It's a beautiful example of using uh, the uh, economics of organic to create a, a real transformation in the farming system. Oh, it was it was a sledgehammer yeah. because when they wanted to insist upon spraying, I could say, "Look, we're going to leave this program ends." Yeah. And the the real the, the real threat was they there was mangoes was one of the crops in this area, and the mangoes from this area happened to be mangoes to die for. They because you're growing them in a desert climate and it's dry when they're when the fruits are maturing, the sugars in these mangoes are off the charts. I mean, it just they're so good. I, I can't describe them. They're, you, they're just amazing mangoes. You can't buy mangoes like this yeah. in the store. Fruit flies got into this area and the uh, Mexican government wanted to eradicate the fruit fly. Uh, and so they wanted to spray. They wanted to aerial spray the entire area. So the I, I had a meeting with the the director of for the from, from Mexico City he was the the head dude for for the Department of Agriculture, and he said, "You guys got to spray this whole entire peninsula. We're going to aerial spray it." This time, we were doing a significant amount of exporting from the area. Every single airplane that flew north, we were loading with basil. All the all their cargo space. But we figured out how to calculate how much cargo space they had and how to balance it better than they did. With we came up with a computer program to do it. They were out doing it by hand. Yeah. And we had a faster, more efficient way to calculate, to optimize how much space. So we were filling every plane. You got one of these planes, you could smell the basil when you flew back. Uh, and they wanted to aerial spray everything. And I told the guy, you aerial spray everything, this whole program ends. And that was like, there was millions of dollars of product yeah. and, and a lot of money, millions of dollars coming into the community to these farmers. And he argued with me and banged his message. Well, we, can, we have to spray it. Said, There's got to be a better way. Ultimately, we convinced him to uh, work with a, we got a grant from the state of California to work with uh, Texas A&M and uh, came up with a way to manage these things without doing the spraying. Without doing the air and spraying. Yeah, because the, it was releases during the, the traditional way they were doing the sterile releases. They'd release when they started doing having detections of the of the of the, uh, of the fly, yeah. and uh, these guys from Texas A and M were down there trying to do a base study of how many flies there were, and were, had a few beers, and they were acting like fruit flies, and they said, well, maybe we should release these flies, release the sterols in the summertime, 
or in the winter time when the when the population crashes and that was a really good idea and so they set up an experiment to do that and that caused the fruit fly population to drop every year yeah. and ultimately we were able to control the fruit flies with they still did some spot spraying yeah. but they didn't do any aerial spraying yeah. so we were we were in mexico um and and del cabo was really taking off now it's known as Jacob's Del Cabo. So, well, it's, it's known that. as Del Cabo, but we've got these, this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing going on with the farming in California, which is under the Jacob's Farm label. And then the Del Cabo piece, which is under the Del Cabo label, but they all share the same warehouse and the same sales and the same accounting. So all the back office stuff is being done together. And, and in the public's eye, they see a label that says Jacob's Del Cabo. Or they, that, well, they see a label that says Jacob's Farm on, on culinary herbs, and they see another label that says Del Cabo for the product that's grown by these thousand or so families that are... Yeah, how many families is it now? It's, I don't know. It's, it's a thousand plus. I mean, it's a lot wow. of families. Yeah, and it's basically a, it's, a it's, cooperative, it's, a producer cooperative. We, you know, so we started when we started this thing, we, we came to it from working in Central America doing what was then called appropriate technology work. But the, the big lesson was that listening to people is really important and hearing how they want to do things is really important and respecting that. So we, that first group that we started working with at the tip of the Baja was uh, it's roughly 300 families today. And they, uh, you know, how they wanted to set it up and how they wanted to manage it. We worked with them with some ideas, but it eventually became what we would call a co-op. But because Mexican law for co-ops is a big, thick binder, uh, it was better not to legally become a co-op in Mexico because of the legal, the, the, it's the legal constraints that were involved. So it's a growers association. Uh, and it's, it started out just as these ajitos that we aggregated. First, we aggregated five ajitos at the tip of the Baja. And uh, with the help, with support from the Mexican government, they set up a what was at that time called a triple S, a Sociedad, Social, Sociedad, Social de Seguridad. Uh, it was a, a community owned business was what it was. And the Mexican government had at that time a, an incorporation, a business incorporation uh, structure that was this SSS, this Sociedad Social Seguridad, it's a way for communities to own a business. So this group of farmers, these families own this business and they have a, uh, uh, a grower's board that's uh, sort of the executive board that makes sort of high level uh, management decisions, uh, approves and, uh, or denies large investments. Um, and it's who I, it's the group that I'll work with if, when there's problems and issues, and you know, I'll meet with them. Uh, and there, the fellow, the young man, who was no, not, no longer young, but I, the guy who I hired 40 years ago to, or 35 years ago to help with the accounting, ultimately became the director of this thing. He's one of the, they were all kids of the different growers. So all these growers, ultimately their kids went to college with money from growing cherry tomatoes and basil. And some of those kids came back and got involved in running the business. And the, the fellow who runs it, who's the director today, would be the equivalent of the CEO. He's, he's the son of one of the growers. Yeah. And a lot of the people who work there are kids of the growers. Have the farms, are the farms typically still small? They are mostly, well, it depends on what part of the, so over time, uh, some of the customers said, you need to supply us all year round. Uh, the, the supermarket chain said, if you don't supply us all year round, we'll go find somebody else to supply us. So it, when that stark reality hit us, uh, we moved north on the peninsula up into the Ensenada area, which is an hour south of San Diego, which is a good summer growing period for tomatoes. And we mirrored what we were doing in the south, but the families there are, were farming grains and larger pieces of ground. So those farms are bigger. And those farms are, you know, they'll, 
you know, they may have 10, 15 acres of crops uh, that they'll rotate through with their with the grain crops that they're growing. The uh, the farms in the south were all these postage size. It, what attracted us to doing this in the beginning was these postage size little farms that were all surrounded by, you know, wild areas. There, there wasn't just this large, big farming area. There were the little tiny places tucked away in the arroyos and here and there. Some of them were contiguous and some of them weren't. And it the aesthetics of it, everything about it was appealing to us. And we had had been working with these little tiny farms in Guatemala. And the, um, you know, we had five years of farming in California. We had, were doing pretty good growing cool weather crops and we were making a living, but it just didn't have, it was missing that piece that, of, uh, that we felt in Guatemala where we were, at the end of the day, you felt like you were helping somebody. You don't have to get paid to help people. It just it feels good. And that was, uh, that was the driver for that. And the similarity between what we saw at the tip of the Baja Peninsula, these little tiny farms, and the problems they were having uh, was similar to what we saw in Central America. And it, um, it just seemed like a, instead of setting up our own farm and trying to rent land, it's just like a better, much better idea. Let's work with all these little farms. Let's teach them how to do this organically. Let's aggregate them so we can get economies of scale. Uh, and and connect them to a marketplace that will appreciate really good food that tastes good, that's grown organically. And uh, that was, uh, you know, the serendipity of the time, the time was, was right. The, there weren't the, the regulations around food safety didn't exist. So it was, you didn't have to jump through so many hoops. Uh, and the success of the first year attracted more families who wanted to join this thing. So if we would go to the beach, somebody would come up to us and say, hey, senor, you're the guy who's working with all the farmers in the community. Can we join? And and it, it got to the point where you know, it was ridiculous. We couldn't go any place without being attacked. We, it, but it grew very quickly. So there was it would double in size every year. Yeah. And eventually we hit a point where there was a, you know, we got to a size where this is a good size, let's stop. And, and then a few years later, uh, other communities from other parts of the peninsula came and asked, how could we join? And it grew very organically that way. And every time one of these groups asked if they would join another community, we'd go back to the growers we started with and the grower, the, um, the executive committee and say, hey, this community is interested in joining. What do you guys think? You want them to join or not? And they would say yes, and then we would there would be some exchange, and they would talk about how they were doing things, and they each community ended up setting up their own, doing a little bit differently. Uh, so some communities, the group in the south, every farmer has his own little plot. Another community decided, well, we're gonna our our farms are all next to each other. We're gonna all do this together. We'll work together. And another other so each group ran it a little differently and managed it a little differently, but they could all see how they were doing it. And they all talked. So today we get together before COVID, we bring all these groups together once a year and go through, okay, what problems are people having? What ideas do people have to do it? So you had this incredible brain trust of people of trying things and experimenting and exchanging ideas and then going back and implementing. And that's gotten us to where we are today. Uh, we've, we've had now two years without those meetings and that we're suffering from it, but we're about to reinitiate that, you know, COVID through a monkey ranch and this stuff. Yeah, so there were two things that was threatening the agriculture in that area. One was uh, that the there was beginning to be a push to adapt what they called modern farming practices. That was the chemicals. Uh, they had they weren't using them. Was a, maybe a few people were, but I didn't know them. the guys that we were working with. Nobody did. They hadn't yet begun using any of these chemicals. And in that period of time, like a year later, like I described earlier, the Ministry of Agriculture began for phytosanitary reasons, uh, telling the farmers to begin to use these chemicals. So that was one threat. Uh, and the challenge that the farmers had was they were all growing, it was a small community. The sign when you drove into San Jose del Cabo said 10,000 people. And 
a lot of those people had little were, were making their living farming. But if when the time you could grow cilantro, everybody grew cilantro. When the time you could grow tomatoes, everybody. So there was just no way to, to market all that stuff. So that was their other challenge they had at the time. But the, the challenge that I, that I think Sandra and I had the farsightedness to, to pick up on was that the government was, had chosen that area to become a tourist area. And they had set up an office to promote tourism and to um, and just build it up into one of the premier uh, beach towns, if you will, of Mexico to attract the Americans during the during the winter, but all year round. So when we started, when you drove from the town of San Jose del Cabo, which was the county seat, to Cabo San Lucas, which was a little tiny fishing community, there wasn't much there. It was all, you were driving along the, the coast and you could see the ocean. There were no hotels. And there'd be this beautiful Sonora Desert juxtaposed on the Sea of Cortez and the Pacific Ocean. Today, when you go down there and you drive that same road, you don't see the ocean. It's wall to wall, that whole stretch, 25, I don't know how many miles it is, but it takes about a half an hour to drive from San Jose to San Lucas. It's all hotels, I mean, huge, giant hotels. You can't see, you don't see the ocean. Maybe you get a peak every once in a while. So that pushed by the um, part of the government to uh, to create this tourist, this mega tourist uh, community uh, was clearly going to threaten the livelihoods and, and the lifestyle and how and impact people's lives. And we thought if we could be successful at, at creating a viable uh, agricultural community that uh, had a significant income and it had some impact in the area, uh, you could it would it would continue, and it would eventually add something to the tourist industry as the tourist industry grew. But these guys would have a good living. And yet, you understand, when we came there, people were making two and $3,000 a year. Two years later, they were making twenty and $30,000 a year. So there was a 10x increase in income by plugging them into export markets. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, people were going to dentists and fix, completing their houses and, and sending their kids to college and doing things that they couldn't do before. And uh, yeah, there were a few guys that, that would go to the bar, but most people use their, their money well and, and wisely. And it ultimately counterbalanced the, the tourist industry. And today there's still a pretty solid agricultural community and it's all organic, uh, growing crops for, for Del Cabo. So and, and some of them for the hotels. So it's now also providing stuff for the hotels. And, uh, and we're on the third generation of kids. The grandkids of the people we started with are the ones who are doing the farming now. If not the kid, the sons and daughters, and the grandkids are beginning. So you said at one point, the government basically, did I get this right, created a law that all the farms shall be organic? No, uh, we, one of the farmers was, who was in the very beginning stages, uh, got, got involved in politics and got elected to uh, a congressional seat at the state level. And th at that time, we, we all we got together, one of our meetings and suggested, let's make the whole county. How can we assure that the whole county is organic? How can we protect the integrity of this county? And through him proposed a, submitted a law that got voted on at the state level to make that entire county to require it to be organic. The only people that weren't organic in the county, all the farmers were organic. 90% of them were participating in Del Cabo and a few others had some other crops that they were selling locally, but they were all farming organic because they had, they saw how it worked. If they needed some, some materials that we used in the co-op, they could come to the co-op and, and get them to, the, they could buy them through the co-op. So the materials that were approved for organics were available in the community. Uh, the only people that weren't organic were the golf courses and the hotels. They were spraying. And, and ultimately, the, the uh, hotels were bringing in plants from the mainland, and that was a source of introducing exotic insects that was a continuous battle. Yeah. <laughs> what can you call it? Because it would just totally disrupt the biological control. And the, all these little farms were surrounded by uh, 
wild areas, you know, what there would be wetlands or there would be just brush and it wasn't forested because it was desert. So th there was any, every entomologist that came down there and worked with was just always blown away by the diversity of insects and the amount of biological control there was because it just was, it was alive. It's, a, it, it gives, it gives them a living example of what could happen if you create an organic landscape. We had, it was a it organic, was, land, it organic was. landscape. And to see that that works very well. But the interruption was these introduced species that would come in from the mainland. And sometimes from the States, they come back from the States. So that was, that was always a challenge because there was always be something. If you compared that county and the production of that county to a county in a similar ecosystem that was not, that was chemical. I, I don't have the, yeah, I can't answer that question. I know. Dave, I'd love to, but I don't have the data yeah. to see, but I do know that there were just lots of insects and lots of beneficial insects. Yeah. And it was always, um, it was always fun to go to see it. It was always fun to hang out with the guys who spent their lives studying whose career was insects. It, and, it, it seems to suggest that if, um, you know, what Syngenta says is that if the world goes organic, we all starve to death. Well, no one was starving, I can tell you that. Yeah. And that's, uh, this argument that we need to use the chemicals and because we, the, the plants can have 11 billion people, We've got enough food now. The problem is food waste. We throw away half the food we grow. Yeah. And, and it's just connecting the, the amount that's grown with the markets at the right time and, and figuring out how to keep things from going bad. We could, do, we could probably feed most of those 11 billion people with, a, with you know, stop the war in the Ukraine with the food that's grown now. Just it's, it's food waste is, a, is, is half of where our food's going. Yeah. Uh, I'm not convinced that, you know, I think that's a, a <laughs> And I hear that as a, you know, we, that's not the problem. It's just, we can grow it. There's, it's not, we don't need more chemicals to do it. Yeah. Yeah. The problems are more social, economic. Yeah. The problem is more social and economic. Yeah. And this, yeah. this, this thought that you need the chemicals, this idea to put toxic chemicals on, you would never use, to, you wouldn't spray your kitchen table with some chlorpyrifos or some other toxic chemical because there's some ants crawling across it, you might wipe them off with a sponge. Why would you spray toxic chemicals on the farmland, on the fields where you're growing the food that you're going to put on your table to eat? It just makes absolutely no sense. And somehow over the last 50 years, that idea of using these toxic chemicals to control, I mean, I get it that when DDT came out and the, the insects fell off the plants and the farmers were, whoa, this is really cool. But now we really understand all the, the ramifications of using these chemicals and the, what they do to our health and what it does to every other insect. And I just go back to the analogy, you wouldn't use this toxic stuff on your kitchen table. Why would you use it on the farmland, on the farms you grow the food on? It just doesn't make any sense. And there's better ways to do it. Biological control systems work pretty well and they're cheaper. And it, you don't have to buy these expensive chemicals. Okay, it's cheaper, it works better. So why, why is it that chemical agriculture is so widespread? It's easier. It's, you know, it's, the organics, you've got to be, it, it's not just a snap of the button. You've got to build that soil up. You've got to get your soil to be healthy. It takes a while to get your soil to be healthy. If you've disturbed it for 30 years farming with chemicals, the, getting the nutrient, the balance just right and the soil health to come back. And when the, our farms here in California, our, all the outside farms, we're not spraying anything on any of these farms. Compost, cover crops, compost and cover crops. And there's something, when the plant's healthy, it's not, it's not attracting, it's not as susceptible to, to these insect problems. Uh, when the system around it is healthy, you don't have these imbalances of, you know, it doesn't hurt to have a few insects that feed on your plant. It's when you have massive numbers of them. And the massive numbers come when something's out of balance. And so if you can keep that balance in the, on the farm with diversity and flowers and different crops, you don't have those. You, you, have, you have spiders and you have insects that parasitize other insects and you have insects that feed on other insects. And you have a few aphids and you have a few things that will chomp on your leaves, but you won't lose your crop. 
and it's less expensive to manage it that way if you don't have to spray something or buy a chemical. Uh, ultimately, I think it's, it's going to cost less to farm that way. So. Okay, so uh, it costs less. It seems so. So your question: So why aren't so? What's the the advantage? Where are these guys using all these chemicals? Because you throw a chemical fertilizer on a plant, you see an immediate response. It's that yield response you can get with those chemicals. And it's what do you need to do? Buy this, put it on. With if you're managing a soil in, a, in an organic way, you've got to build that soil back up. It's harder. It's that takes a little bit more patience. Maybe it's just the patience, but certainly you can get reason. You can get yields just as good. And I know guys who are growing uh, row crops who get yields that are better organically. Yeah. It's the trick is they get those that soil really balanced and really tuned in. So it's more information driven. It's, yeah, it's more information driven. I think we've been driven. I, I would say we've lost 50 years of, of learning. The, the chemicals have been a, a, a taken us down a path that we've learned how to use these chemicals and we've learned a lot of stuff about chemicals, but we haven't learned a lot of stuff about biological systems. We haven't learned how do the soils work? What's the biology in the soil that makes it work? How does biocontrol and insects, all this stuff with entomology, that's all new science. Uh, so we've lost time by the introduction of these chemicals. And, and now there's the pressure of, there's a whole industry built up around these chemicals and in, in, uh, in industry to produce them and sell them. And in industry within the university systems that teaches young people how to use them. And I think part of the success of organics has been in this last 30 years, there's been more and more research to understand how the soil works. The advent of uh, be able to, to sequence and understand what the or fungi and bacteria are in the soil to begin to understand the complexity and how that changes when you add organic matter versus when you add, what happens when you add herbicide and real, ooh, you just do affect the, the microbiota in that soil is, is, is beginning to give us the tools to manage these systems better. And does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so I have to ask a question that's probably going to seem odd to you, but uh, ask your it, odd question. It, it is the theme of, of this year's symposium, which is the question is, is, is organic regenerative? I think by its nature, it's regenerative if it's done right. Yeah. I, I, when the or when you when the when the Organic Food Act was passed, it was based on uh, healthy soils and, and building, building a soil. Uh, when uh, today's certification, you've got to have crop rotations, you've got to do cover crops, and you've got to add compost. And it's just the basics of farming organically. And those practices uh, build healthy soils. And healthy soils are sustainable to last a long time. Uh, the flip the coin around the other side of that is using these chemical fertilizers, you start getting salt buildups and imbalances in the soils. And uh, How long can you farm? You know, if you just do monocrop year after year, after year, no cover crop, don't put any organic matter back into the soil. Ultimately, those yields are going to start to go down and you start to have more and more problems. Your soils become more compacted as your organic matter decreases. The porosity and the, and the, and the ability of that soil to, to hold uh, nutrients goes down. The structure of the soil, uh, it loses some of its aggregation. It, it, all this stuff farmers know. And it, how, long, how long can you farm that way? So I think your question, is it regenerative? I think maybe another way to say it is a sustainable way to continue taking food off of ground by putting things back into it. And so one of the, I think that answers your question. It, it does. We, we have to, I think, say that, and I, I don't mean certified by real organic project, but 
you'd have to say, well, real organic is regenerative because there's a lot of stuff being called organic that doesn't fit the description that you just gave. Like some of it has no soil at all. Right. Well, we can have that discussion. Okay. Yeah, that's, it's, it's not, it certainly doesn't go to the heart of what the farming organically uh, was envisioned when the Organic Food Act was passed. And uh, I'm at a stage in life where it's important to, I want to see young people growing food in a way that's healthy for all of us. And, and it's encouraging to me in the last 10 years to see this, uh, the interests of this next generation in farming. And along with that, I think it's important that they learn that there's, that the soil is a living, that has you know, billions of organisms in it, fungi and bacteria, and earthworms and all kinds of critters living in it. And that that's what sustains a plant. And that's the essence of where our food is coming from. And that's what feeds us. And it's, uh, and that's what you need to take care of if you want to have a sustainable or regenerative system. And it's encouraging that we're starting to see some of this stuff being taught in, in, in our universities uh, and that young people are tuning into the importance of soil. Uh, I, I, you know, when the soil loses the capacity to, grow to feed you, that's when your society ends. That's when the Roman Empire falls apart. Uh, and that's when uh, the modern Western society would fall apart the day that our, our soil stops providing us sustenance. So the, it's critical that we farm them in a way that's sustainable and regenerative. And farming them organically requires this rotations, cover crops, the compost, which is really just adding uh, microbes, you know, inoculating your soil, making sure it has the right stuff in it. Uh, that you can farm this same land over and over again and do it in a way that you'll get a healthy, flavorful tomato or lettuce crop off of it. And if you don't do those things, you start having problems. And when you start having problems, you eventually go, well, where are the chemicals? <laughs> right. All right, let me ask a, the the other half of that question, which is, is regenerative organic? So, so I, I need to answer the question by saying I was out of the country for five years. When the word regenerative started being used, uh, it was being used when I was uh, modeling Del Cabo in Tanzania. And so when we came back here after five years in Tanzania, all of a sudden there were people doing stuff was called regenerative. And it's, and so when somebody asked me to, to lead a workshop at a conference on regenerative ag, and I said, well, I don't know anything about it. I said, well, you're farming organically. That's what it is. So, okay, I can do that part of it. But I think that the piece, the regenerative piece now is starting to talk about more about tillage and you know, how can we minimize tillage, especially on, on our row crops and uh, in beans and maize and uh, lentils and those kinds of things. And how do you prove soil uh, aggregation and soil structures, this tillage damages soil structure. Every time you run a, a, a disc across the field, you break break up the soil. It's not that's not what happens to nature. Uh, so that there's a piece of the regenerative pieces about soil management, and how you to do it in a way that that minimizes the damage to the soil that you do when you till it, and and so that the soil stays healthy. I think the two practices are uh, the two words organic. I think the regenerative is a, a subset of organic with more emphasis on tillage practices and how looking for ways to reduce tillage. And I think what's happened in the Midwest with minimum or no till really goes to the heart of this. Now, this is discussion if a guy's doing no till, but he's using herbicides to make the no till work. Is that regenerative? I would say no, because that's, those herbicides are disturbing the soil microbiome. And they're not going away, they're getting into our water table, somewhere going in the air, 
Um, some of the real nasty ones are killing other plants. Uh, so finding a way to do the no-till without the herbicides would be truly a regener regenerative system, ultimately moving the system to organic. And when you start using the chemical fertilizers, you're adding all these, you're disrupting the soil microbiome again. And it's, uh, I think of it like, you know, if you're, uh, you can live on Coca-Cola for a little while, it'll keep you going, but ultimately it'll kill you. And uh, it's, urea and these heavy nutrient levels we get just giving us big shots in the arm of these chemical fertilizers can't be good for the system so a truly regenerative system would would encompass all the practices that, are, that a good organic grower uses today to grow food all right that's the way i see it thank you <laughs> um larry is there before we close is there something you would like to say or talk about that you go, you know, it's important to say. Uh. Uh, yeah, for, for young people who tune in to have an opportunity to hear this talk, I will just share with them that growing food is the most satisfying endeavor that one can embark on. And uh, uh, people eat three times a day. It's the essence of our health. Good food grown in a way that provides good sustenance and and that for those of you that are uh, interested in pursuing careers, uh, I'd encourage you to consider a career in, in agriculture and growing food or some part of the food system. And that growing food organically is providing society with, with the medicine to be healthy. Thank you. All right, Jacobs, thank you very much for talking today. You're welcome. Great. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure having you. Right. I look forward to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe, share it with your friends, and leave us a rating and a review so that others can find us. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org and by following our YouTube channel. Please join us next time when you'll hear directly from me from my EcoFarm speech about why the Real Organic Project is more important now than ever as we learn more about the winners of the USDA's $3 billion in funding for climate smart agriculture. We're tackling this subject as it relates to the rising popularity of the word regenerative in conjunction with chemical no-till. Our upcoming symposium is on two consecutive Sundays beginning February 26th and Sunday, March 6th. All ticket holders will also get recordings to the event in case you need to miss it. You can learn more at realorganicsymposium.org.